Um, good evening, everyone. <clears throat> Uh, thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, my uh, name is Fernando, and um, I'm the Learning and Engagement Curator um, here at the Douglas Hyde Gallery of Contemporary Art. Um, um, thank you again for joining us this evening. We have uh, uh, we are very pleased uh, to to have one of our artists talk this evening, uh, and on this occasion we are extremely lucky to have with us uh, um, internationally renowned uh, artist uh, Tom Bor with us. Um, um, this talk is being has been co-created by um, artist uh, Adam Xu Yan Shou um, as part of his current exhibition. Uh, at Gallery 2 within our artist I, I project. So you can see um, Adam on camera now, um, and then you can see some of the exhibitions on on, on the background as well in there. Um, so, so yeah, uh, Adam, very welcome. Um, and now we see Tom there joining us too. Um, before we start, um, a bit of housekeeping. Um, we're gonna have some questions at the end. Um, it's gonna be a very rich conversation. We're gonna learn loads about a particular one of uh, Tom's projects. Uh, so do uh, you have any questions? So you have any comments during, to, during the conversation, during Tom's presentation, and then uh, the kind of uh, conversation between Adam and Tom, just feel free to use the chat box facility in the YouTube channel, um, and we'll get to your comments in there as well. Um, if you haven't seen Adam's exhibition here with us, uh, it's running until the end of this week. So it's only a few days. Uh, so make sure you make some time because it's a wonderful show. Um, as I said, you can see some, some of it now on, on behind me, but I think it's something that needs to be experienced in person on the gallery as well. Um, Another thing, uh, Culture Night is coming. Uh, so Culture Night is happening this Friday. So uh, just to see our program, we have a very interesting kind of uh, set of projects happening on Friday. Uh, we have uh, a performance uh, by Amanda Coogan. We have a, a tour of the exhibition with our director, Dr. Georgina Jackson, uh, with an ISL interpreter as well. And we have uh, the Open Forum, which is uh, one of the projects of our uh, student forum and project as well. So that's the housekeeping from my side. Um, um, so before I pass it on to, to Adam to introduce the event and to introduce uh, Tom, um, I would like to thank our friends and patrons and uh, the Arts Council of Ireland and Trinity College uh, Dublin for the continued support. And I would also like to thank uh, the Get Institute for supporting uh, um, Adam's uh, project or exhibition with us as well. So that's for me for now. So I pass it on to, to Adam next. Thank you, Fernando. I'll now begin by introducing Tom, uh, his biography and part of the motivation for inviting him to speak with us today. Tom Burr lives and works in New York. He has shown extensively throughout Europe and the United States. He has recently was the subject of a solo exhibition entitled Hinged Figures at the Waldsworth Athenaeum Museum of Art in Hartford, Connecticut. Burr's work has been collected by major museums internationally, including the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York, Migros Museum in Zurich, MoCA, Los Angeles, Mumok in Vienna, the New York Public Library of New York City, Zalmung Grasslin in Germany, Zalmung Verbund in Vienna, Ludwig Museum in Cologne, Hammer Museum Los Angeles, FRIC France, Baltimore Museum of Art Baltimore, and the Israel Museum in Jerusalem. Burr attended the School of Visual Arts and the Whitney Independent Study Program in New York. Burr is currently in the midst of a new project, which we've invited him to speak about on this occasion. Over the last couple of years, he's been working from a repurposed industrial warehouse in the city of Torrington, located in Northwestern Connecticut. Torrington is a site-specific archival project, which is temporary and impermanent, unfolding over a period of three years. Burr joins us here in the midst of its duration to describe Torrington's retrospective nature and share some insight into the process of rediscovery and re restoration which constitute the work. As part of the Artist Eye series, Liz Magor invited me to show in tandem with her exhibition, The Rise and the Fall, currently on display at the Douglas Hyde. My presence here is perhaps contingent on a type of lineage formed in part by geographical origins, shared interest and chance. When thinking about the roles of artistic and environmental affiliations in shaping subjectivity, whether genuine, imagined, or staged, 
or quickly comes to mind. For this exhibition, I've brought together works that drift through the southern boroughs of Berlin, namely along central stretches of the city's Telto Canal. These works were developed through recurrent walks and daily observations, archiving instances of deterioration and renewal. Waterways that operate as veins, feeding into the city, transporting forms of scrap and waste, the distance span between bridges, stratified recordings of former and present day industry, collectively point to places where slivers of the past, present and future coalesce. This project feeds into a larger compendium of digital and physical excursions, speculating upon instances of disappearance, savoring the fleeting stillness which punctuate between boom cycles. It was this act of historical mythology, collaging, amplified experiences sourced from the present tense with the archival fodder of civic museums that brought me to think about Burr's Torrington. Oscillating between intimacy and restraint, interweaving threads of personal narrative with the appropriated, gleaned, and reconstructed, Burr composes stories which complicate notions of fixed identity and authorship. Whether it be through erasures in public space, the portrait of a fading star, or architectures of privacy, birth sculptures and installations distill the process of antiquation using a medley of biographical fragments. Obsolescence and the human residue, which mark discarded and reimagined objects and places, are threads which, to my mind, run through both exhibitions on view and birth practice at large. So please join me uh, in giving a warm welcome and a big thank you to Tom Burr for taking the time to speak with us today. Thank you very much, uh, Adam, um, and thank you everybody, Fernando and everybody at the Douglas Hyde Museum for uh, this kind invitation for me to speak about Torrington Project. Um, it's a interesting thing for me, as Adam just mentioned, um, that this kind of tagging of one artist to another, um, which I find very pleasing that that Adam's uh, exhibition uh, is in, in concert or, or, or in sequence with Liz Magor's exhibition. And then in turn, um, that, that Adam uh, nodded to me to, to kind of continue that cycle and this sort of intergenerational and transcontinental um, affections between artists is something that I uh, take very seriously. So I was very flattered to be invited in this particular context. Um, the Torrington Project, um, and Adam sort of very kind of uh, succinctly sketched out what its parameters are, is a, something of a, um, a conceptual loading dock for me, I would say. I started this project um, in some ways many, many, many years ago. When I was quite young, I always wanted to somehow, somehow come to terms with the, my ambivalence around studio and studio practice. Uh, my ambivalence and confusion um, about isolation relative to artistic practice, my mixed emotions about uh, being an artist relative to isolation and then involvement within the various communities and transactional relationships that um, come out of that. So I've been working on this idea uh, for many, many years. Um, which I'm not sure I realized until it actually came to fruition. So Torrington Project started about two years ago. It was during the pandemic and partially because of the pandemic, but as I have just explained, also predated uh, the pandemic perhaps by decades. I wanted to have a large space, um, an atypically large space that I could um, both play with spatially, I could um, take into account uh, works of mine that had been lost, damaged, forgotten. Um, I don't have access to all my work. I have some work that I have kept in my collection, uh, but that's very little, actually. Uh, but there are works that had fallen through the cracks over the years. There are works that certain galleries or institutions couldn't store, couldn't transport. And all of these problems, all of these problems of the movement of work, the shipment and the movement of works of art uh, was one of the pressing um, uh, conditions that prompted me to start the Torrington Project. Over, since I started working as an artist in the late 1980s, I've been taught and influenced by artists who were in some ways 
against a traditional notion of studio. So I was in a program that was primarily instructed by uh, post-studio artists, um, people like Barbara Kruger, Martha Rossler, people like Michael Asher. Um, and then I continued to be interested in this more nomadic quality where an artist could perhaps work from any place. And particularly as um, real estate um, became more and more dire and dear, as prices started to escalate, the conundrum of becoming involved in that as an artist and deciding that you had to have that kind of a structure seemed to be an impossibility. It seemed to also be a, a, a self-confining sort of space to be in. So I made the commitment to myself that I could work on a table such as you see in front of you in a very small room. I could work on a laptop. I could work in a cafe. I could work on site. I wasn't going to become slave to a particular studio. And yet, um, for this project, I wanted to have some of that luxury for a period of time, the luxury of space. Many times when I've been at an exhibition, particularly an institutional exhibition, I've been able to play with space. I've been able to, to uh, luxuriate in the dynamics across vast areas and see one work ricochet off another in a way that a traditional studio does not provide, both spatially or temporally. So one of the things I wanted to do in Torrington was to gather works of mine from various periods, um, starting in the mid to late 1980s. I think the earliest work here might be 1987, um, up through the present time. I looked for spaces um, outside of New York, and within striking distance of where I live. I, I do live in New York still, but I have sort of um, gravitated up to a house north of the city, about two and a half hours north of New York City, at the northern corner of Connecticut, where it meets Massachusetts. Um, and I found a space here uh, when I was looking at many, many different spaces that I, I sort of fell in love with. And it was exactly the kind of space that I told myself I wouldn't have which was a, a romantic 19th century repurposed industrial building. It felt like the kind of uh, romantic cliche I was not wanting to be involved with. It felt predictable and it felt um, somewhat um, rehearsed. Uh, and so I wanted a different kind of choreography for, for what I was going to do. And yet I kept coming back to this space because it was the most beautiful space. It was also the space I could make work financially. It also made sense geographically. And so as I looked at it, as I looked at this kind of uh, particular building type that had seen trace to history through industrial spaces such as Soho in New York City, through um, institutions like the Dia Art Foundation, Dia Beacon, Marfa, all of these kinds of spaces, from the 1960s and 1970s, where artists had repurposed these spaces. It started to make sense for me as a kind of um, stage set. If much of my work had to do with a dialogue, both with and against work from that time period, specific figures from that time period, then the space could also be kind of swept into that dialogue as well. That was my thinking. And it came to it came to be very pleasing to work that way. The space with its um, particular character that was reminiscent of the spaces I just mentioned and the histories I just mentioned started to become a work unto itself, started to become a character, um, as well as the works in the space becoming characters. What I started to do when I took the space was I worked very closely with a woman named Christine Massinio, who was a colleague of mine. We had worked together at galleries. Christine knew my work very well. We, um, she is now the uh, director of Freeze New York and Freeze Los Angeles, um, but at the time um, was working freelance. And I proposed to her that she work on this project as sort of part of the brain trust, rethinking my archive, going into my archive, looking at things that had been um, forgotten, things that question marks that existed in my records. And we went to Bard, um, 
uh, the college, which is not so far from here on the Hudson, where the archives of my former gallery, American Fine Arts Company, and Pat Hearn Gallery were located. And we did lots of research at the beginning of this project to sort of cite where certain works were that my galleries might not have um, had in their inventory and that might have been taken apart, might have been dismantled, might have been destroyed, uh, all of the above, um, because we're talking about um, several decades or a few decades um, of, of accumulation of practice. So that was this kind of rich kind of archival sort of think think period having to do with Torrington. And I would wander around the space and feel the space and think about what could be done to sort of demarcate the space in a way that allowed it to be both this open, vast 15,000 square foot warehouse space that was filled with light, surrounded by windows. And where would I make certain divisions, certain walls that could accommodate certain works that needed that slightly more framed neutral moment and would also feel like cutouts from other institutional spaces. Um, and I started to create zones throughout the space. The zones were um, the studio, which is the space that I actively make work in. Um, it is the closest probably to what one would expect to come um, when visiting an artist. Works might be in process, although I don't typically allow many people in during that period um, out of any number of anxieties and phobias and protectionisms that I've um, taken on and hold uh, onto dearly. Uh, but for this project, which I, the Torrington project, which I've also defined to the outside world and to myself as a performance, um, that studio space became activated in a way that I was uncomfortable with, which was outside of my levels of comfort. Um, so I did beyond what we're calling, I'm calling the Torrington Project, I produced three um, distinct gallery exhibitions from this location. I produced an exhibition or created an exhibition for my gallery in London a year ago, June at Maureen Paley's um, and then I, following September, um, at Gallery Neu in Berlin, and then the spring after that, this past spring, at my gallery uh, in New York, Bortolami Gallery. Um, so those three galleries, the work that I created here in Torrington, uh, Torrington Project, created a kind of, um, a kind of satellite to the space, a kind of there's a kind of tethering line that went out from the space here to those different locations. And that site, that line, that sight line is always there, right? It's always there um, between the site of creation, production, and thinking, and the, the site of display and exhibition and transactional relationships. But I wanted those things to ricochet back and forth more quickly. I wanted Torrington Project to take on some of the roles of the institution. I wanted Torrington Project to have a kind of self-conscious sort of neuroses about its own being um, kind of registering different pressure points in my life. So each one of my galleries has a sort of presence here through works coming to, to the space from them so that they are represented um, as characters in the space in some way. Um, you know, Maureen Paley um, has work here and has visited here. Stefania Bortolami has work here. I mean, I mean, work on consignment from the gallery and has been here. Franco Nuero from um, Italy has made the journey to Torrington Project and has work here that has passed through that gallery as well. And also Gary Noy from Berlin. They have come and visited the space. And there's this, so there's this kind of um, uh, elasticity that I'm trying to create between the different sites that I'm hoping is distinct from the kind of export site that a studio typically is, where work is simply produced, people come, tap it, and it gets um, exited out. There's an awful lot of work here that has come in here to the Torrington Project as if through a filter. I wanted this think space 
to change the work that entered here from the outside. Obviously, it generated work anew in the, what I'm calling the studio, but there's also work that came here um, and was changed here. Another area of the space, another zone within the Torrington Project I call the clinic. And these are terms that were not uh, so severely structured. They came about uh, between myself and the people who were working here, uh, often out of humor, um, and then somehow it's usually out of habit. So the clinic is where works that needed repair came in, works that I wasn't quite ready to look at yet, works that needed um, to be dusted off and restored. And there were early works of mine that had to do with New York City park spaces, a thematic that I was involved in um, for several years in the late uh, 1980s through the mid to late 1990s public spaces in New York and other places, but specifically these works from New York that I had not shown in a very long time. I wasn't sure that I wanted to show again, certainly not now. I needed to reckon uh, with them again. And I did so here, I thought about them again. I get, was able to look at them in concert with what I was doing now and in concert with works that were made at different points during my the arc of my work. And so I restored two works that then went to an exhibition at PS1, uh, MoMA PS1 Museum in New York. So this was another kind of moment of an extension as I, as I think it, as I feel it, um, of the Torrington Project out into the world. And then they returned here um, uh, to Torrington Project as well. Um, there's another, um, space. It took me a while, you know, to figure out where there might be walls and where there might not be walls and what zones are isolated and what zones aren't isolated. And there's another, um, the image in front of you now is um, one third of a work called Container 123 that was created in 2001 for a museum project and museum exhibition in Berlin at an institution called NGBK with a curator named Frank Wagner. Um, and it was part of um, an exhibition that was about uh, broken relationships. Um, artists who had been partnered, artists who were uh, together as couples, who were lovers, who worked together as well as lived together in various degrees, and um, one partner had uh, died uh, due to complications of AIDS. The other had lived. And um, my partner uh, from the late 1980s, early 90s, was a man named Ul Hohn, who a painter from uh, Germany who I'd met at the Whitney Independent Study Program and uh, died in 1995. Uh, but in that work from 2001, I created those three containers which were based on Donald Judd's uh, works, concrete works from Marfa, Texas. They were sort of a play off of them, a sort of um, morphing of um, their concerns, um, a hybridization of their concerns and, and, a, and a concern with much more interior space than external environment. And around that, those works that I created, that work that I created, Container 123, uh, the works of Ul uh, I curated on the wall. And so one of aspect of my life and of my practice and of my work has been to carry Ul's work along with me um, since he, he couldn't. Um, and that is an instance of, 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 of that kind of um, continued collaboration after his, after his passing. Um, and that work, not the one in front of you now, but that container is in a part of the space, a zone of the space I call the museum. And I kind of um, lovingly, humorously call it the museum because it does feel the most um, rigid, the most unchanging, the most professional in some ways, uh, which is to say the most classical, the most um, uh, um, polished in terms of here's another example of those three containers together in that space I'm calling the museum. 
beyond the museum, uh, there was a space I called the lounge. And that was exactly what it sounds like. It was a, con a constellation of furniture that I that I acquired for this particular space in Torrington, where we would relax, where I'd have drinks parties, where I would um, talk with curators, school groups, the various publics who have come through the, the space of which there have been many people over the course of the last two years. It's never been open to the public. Uh, per se, it's by invitation, it's by knowing about it, it's by people asking if they can come. This is a work that I was mocking up here for my show at Maureen Paley's Gallery in London, uh, June of last year. Um, but that lounge space then got dismantled when I was working on my show at Bertolami Gallery and the furniture pieces themselves got turned into works in the space that were a very conscious tether to um, to the space in Torrington. So that relationship to Torrington, not simply did these work just come from my studio, but they came from the Torrington project and everything that this had accumulated in the interim. And they had a very sort of um, umbilical <laughs> relationship to this space. Again, the constellation of works here in a space that I'm speaking from that small plywood box in the corner right now that is the office. And that was a pre-existing condition. That was a space that was always here. I thought I would dismantle it when I first arrived here. You can see the inside of it behind me. Um, because it was covered with garbage, it had walls leaning up against it. You couldn't see it. I figured it would have to just be carted away and then we cleaned it and uh, cleaned the glass, emptied it out, and it became obviously something that had to stay here for the duration of the project and perhaps will um, go with me after this project is over after three years. Because one thing that was very important to me was, you know, I made a work once. My work has often been in dialogue with um, earlier works. Um, earlier legacies, issues of uh, traditional and um, 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 orthodox ideas of site specificity. I was always interested in working against those histories and, un and unfolding them, opening them up, um, allowing them to um, be open to different histories, different subjectivities, um, specifically queer subjectivities and histories initially. And now I have a much more expanded notion of what I mean by that, but I wanted to pollute them. I wanted to exploit them. I wanted to open them up and um, alter them, alter the trajectory of their histories through my own work. So when I conceived of, of, of Torrington Project, I thought about it in relationship to a work of mine that I made in 2000 at the same time that I made the works Container 123 that had been dismantled that was many years ago and then recreated here, a work called Deep Purple um, that had um, taken on Richard Serra's Tilted Arc work, uh, a piece he made in the 1980s and 1981, I believe, in New York City that then was dismantled in 1989 after a long court battle with the city of New York. Um, but Richard Serra said that to dismantle Tilted Arc, to destroy Tilted Arc was to destroy the work. Um, so this notion that the site specificity, the site of the work um, constituted um, its legitimacy is something that I've been interested in working against. So Deep Purple was in contrast or in contradistinction to Tilted Arc was nomadic, was promiscuous. It could pick up many different sites. It was always trying to camouflage itself and its conditions was always trying to be mobile um, and accommodating. And I thought of these as, as certain kinds of queer parameters at the time that I was interested in, 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 in uh, employing. And so as with Deep Purple, so is the Torrington Project, that it is not about permanence, that it is not about um, extreme longevity, that it is not about monumentality in the long run, uh, that it is about, um, it's more akin to a stage set that is set up, has its run, has its duration, and then ends and then closes. I'm going to just sort of 
finish what the zones are of, of the space. And then I'll talk a little bit more about some of my ideas um, in relationship to the Torrington project and what's here. Um, beyond the, the studio and the museum uh, and the clinic and the lounge, there are two other very distinct spaces. Here's another view of the museum space that includes a work from uh, 2006 on the left, a series of photographs I did for an exhibition in Lausanne, Switzerland uh, called Burville, which was about actually a small sort of defunct town in Connecticut that may or may not have anything to do with my name, but captivated me because it seemed like a sort of decoy of revealing myself or not. The work in the center, the container with plants is a work from 1993 that uh, was called Construction of an American Garden, which was in a exhibition at American Fine Arts Company in New York um, uh, called What Happened to the Institutional Critique. And that exhibition became a kind of pivotal exhibition for my generation and, and subsequent generations around the ideas of, of re-exploring or reinvesting in, in ideas around um, the institution and, and, and criticality. Um, and that's a work, that plant work from 1993 that had to do initially with the Ramble in Central Park and Frederick Law Olmsted's creation of the Ramble. All the plants in it um, were um, from Olmsted's list of plants that had originally been in the Ramble, a complete act of artifice by him, but one that was supposed to create an indigenous uh, native American landscape. Of course, it was just highly constructed and artificial. And I was interested in that relative to um, relative to the constituencies who used the park, which were primarily at that time bird watchers and gay male cruisers. And I was interested in that kind of collapse, that mashup, that that complicatedness of publics within the public um, uh, within within the New York City Park system. Um, earlier work on the wall in the back from 1988, 89, one of the earliest works here, pictured, and you can't see the pictured, but is Ulhon, the, the artist that I lived and worked with, who would uh, make paintings that included me, and I would reciprocate out of issues of proximity and ease. We we just were at a very early point in our um, in our creative lives in New York. Um, and then ricocheting from that, reverberating over to work that is new in the process of being made that I made for my show at Bortolami Gallery. The other two zones um, were are a space I call the gallery, which I think there have been images up on this slideshow, that is um, the most, the one space that negates the surrounding space the most. There's a sheetrock wall, an eight foot sheetrock wall on three sides. You feel contained by it. You feel when you step into it, and I created a suite of new works for this space specifically, you feel as if you've stepped into a stage play that might be about a, be about a gallery in New York or a gallery elsewhere. The conditions of um, light, the, the, the absence of, of some of the um, other uh, industrial, 19th century industrial uh, elements, they're above that eight feet, they're there, but you feel a little bit like you're in a microcosm um, in that way, and I wanted that. Uh, sensation that you're stepping into the idea of a gallery for a moment. And that is um, um, where a suite of works that I made um, called Studio Contortion Sequence um, were created. And then there's the last space um, in the, um, well, there are two more spaces, but one of the last spaces that I've named is called, um, affectionately called The Unconscious. And that is the space that has the least amount of windows in it. It's where um, this young man working with me, Elijah, has made a kind of encyclopedic organization of everything we have here with files, with um, boxes, with anything from bolts to um, uh, transparencies and 35 millimeter photographs and and sneakers and books and things like this. This is all organized in that space, as well as um, a sort of cross sampling of the many drawings and notes and um, doodles, et cetera, that I've done over the year. 
you know, drawing and planning and plotting for an exhibition has always been a very private practice for me. I've never shown my drawings, um, these drawings in that way. They've always been for internal use only. They've been shop drawings for fabricators. They've been um, exhibition delineations for galleries. They've been notes that I might jot down. I've always kept journals, but if I'm in a, if I'm traveling and I'm in a cafe or a bar or a restaurant um, working on an exhibition and I'm having wine and having dinner, I take notes on a napkin and or I or, or write them down on a piece of paper that then enters back into the journal. And these have always been for my eyes only. And I felt with this project, the Torrington project, that it was one about well, it was one of um, it was one of exposure. Um, exhibition making takes place here. Um, and I wanted that kind of exposure uh, that comes with the dog and pony show that is the studio visit that comes with that sacred private space that is the studio um, where people expect to get a little bit more, a, a little bit more of a reveal, a little bit more into who you are. And I've always dodged that. I've always tried to make my own subjectivity as complicated as possible. Uh, I've always tried to um, uh, surround it with certain degrees of, of question mark, of fluidity and of, of biographical um, obscurity, uh, simply because I'm I'm very very aware that that is also um, a marketing muscle, a marketing muscle to try to nail down uh, the specifics of of the of the artist themselves. So this is a space that, in some ways, has taken that on as a theatrical kind of performance. Um, typically, when I've talked about the Torrington Project, it's either been for a print interview or more often it's me walking through this space. And there you see a work in the foreground that's in the process of being installed that had fallen through the cracks, a work from 1996 that I then recreated years, years later, just recently for a show at a gallery called Green Neftali in New York. It's not finished in this image, but then you see the quote unquote museum beyond it. And on the flip side of that wall, that dividing wall is what I call the studio, which is where I, I kind of nestle in to, to actually make certain works that are new or work on older works as well. Um, and that kind of zone play um, becomes very much like a scene change for me in a, in a sort of theatrical production. And one of the sort of anecdotes that I sort of think about when I talk about this these these sort of scene changes as I walk through the very two large rooms. It is it is hard to perceive the space through these images. Um, but I am often um, um, uh, trying to think about all of my activities um, as a kind of performance. To me, it, it unleashes so much possibility about what a, a sculptural work can be. It unleashes so much possibility in terms of slipping between thinking about my own body, thinking about my own biography, thinking about the biography of others, thinking about the bodies of others, thinking about a single work in constellation, in a constellation of other works, where there are always threads that connect one work to the other, to the other, to the other. And that's what, that was always my sort of um, aspirational <laughs> um, trajectory when I was quite young was I always wanted to have a lot of accumulation. I always wanted to be able to look back on various different moments that one work might complete another and complete another and complete another. One thing, one particular work was never an isolated moment. This work in front of you can't exist without all the things that are out of frame. It's context, obviously, but that context is, is myriad and it's shifting continually. Um, so one of the things that I want to do now with this project, and there's another year plus of this, so we are where are we are in September right now. So this project is going to continue through next fall and terminate um, January of 25. Um, it'll probably break down for a while, just like any theatrical production would break down at the end. I'll have to, return the space in the condition that I found it within reason, works of mine that came out of storage, that whose storage problem 
I solved by the Torrington project will either be resolved by then or I'll have to take take on that task once more. Um, and for this final phase, there are going to be a number of even more pronounced uh, performance or performative gestures. I'm going to be working with um, uh, an artist who works in performance and dance who cannot be here uh, on site very much. And that started to intrigue me. She doesn't live here and she can't live here right now um, because she's raising her child elsewhere in Europe. And I started to become very attracted to the idea that she might be able to direct something from afar and that we might direct something uh, through, through a series of conditions and um, directions that might be in some way riffing on or thinking about my own relationship to the space as I walk through it. My, the body of me as I walk through and play artist and am, and, am the artist, um, it walks on both sides of the street. It's incredibly pronounced and arch and in quotations at the same time that it's deeply felt um, and very real to me. Um, that I am performing myself walking through the space. I want um, this performance that she will direct to, to in some way encapsulate that and exaggerate that and investigate that and 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 in some ways make fun of that, perhaps. Um, uh, because I I want it to be, I want there to be some element of exaggeration there. And that always implies to me a degree of humor. And as well as as that element of the next phase, there's going to be other works that are going to come into the space. There's a collector who made um, this project financially feasible for me to do through the acquisition of an early work, an acquisition that I directed. I simply asked him during a conversation when he had always said that he loves, uh, he has quite a few of my works and said, but I've, I've always wanted to do something that would actually be more exciting, which might be some something project-based, something that I have more of a collaborative role in. And I said, you know what, I, I think I think I have I have the project for you. Um, and he agreed to purchase an earlier work of mine from the 90s and sort of earthwork. And that the funds from that allowed me to have a certain degree of freedom from um, anxieties about the rent and about everything I wanted to do here. Um, and allow me to play in the way I wanted to play for a period of time, for an isolated period of time. Um, certain works from, from his collection that have meaning to me, meaning, for instance, also he has works of Ulhon, the artist I mentioned, who I was partnered with, who, who died, who is inscribed in this space already. Um, works of his that I selected for this collector to purchase will also come to Torrington Space and be on view. And there are other examples of other artists now that are going to layer on to what I've done here as well. And the final kind of um, component chapter is going to be a book. Um, I want to have a very hefty volume that brings this project out into the world, disseminates this project in a different way. In some ways, this project was extremely site driven. And I it started from all the frustrations and desires that I laid out earlier in this conversation, in this talk, um, things that I felt I needed, things that I wanted, things that I was in a position to exploit at this time, things that I'd always wanted, perhaps, but can do now do for a certain period of time. I want those to fold into a book. And I want that book to go out into the world because the condition of this project was it's about, as I say, about two hours north of, of New York City. People had to make a pilgrimage to come here. And it did come out of some of my frustrations about conversations that one has to have about your work, particularly relative to that, um, that momentous thing called the market, which can be almost debilitating at times and has taken a lot of fortitude on my uh, part to navigate um, had has almost crippled me many times in my, my past. Um, so I needed space, I needed distance, and I needed to physically structure the conversation on my terms. So physically, I wanted to say, you are going to come to where I am, almost as if it was a discursive act. You're going to start from where I am. Um, 
and that 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 is what I require for the for the viewing of my work for this period of time. I call it my kind of glorious failure, uh, which might be in some ways what I think all art making is some sort of beautiful failure, uh, where it has this poetic thrust and aspirations and uh, goals that are always going to be met with disappointment. Um, but this project is is sort of amplifying that. Um, emotional register. And so this book, um, this album, will be in some ways the project folded into a portable box in some ways. And things like the act of bringing other artists' work in, the performance that will happen here, all the photographic documentation, all the collaborations I've done here thus far, all of my transactional relationships, all of my personal relationships, all of those things will be inscribed into this book. And then this book will then go out into the world. And rather than um, rather than uh, performing for a public here, in some ways we're going to be performing now for this book. And this book becomes um, the Torrington Project going forward. I think, um, unless I'm wrong, that brings me sort of to a good ending point for our conversation to start um, uh, with Adam. Yeah, thank you so much for the dense and informative presentation there, Tom. Yeah, so following our earlier conversation and thinking a bit more about Torrington, I prepared a few questions just before opening things up to the audience. So it's like, yeah, so I was taking note of some statements, some things you said on neurosis of being or protectionism, decoy, this kind of maybe deeply private persona, which you may be protected by fragmenting out with certain references and uh, this being a kind of counterpoint to that. So um, surveillance and control have always been kind of reoccurring subjects within your practice. And in one sense, Torrington provides you with an opportunity to wield control as the sole author presenting yourself along with the archive. On the other hand, your autonomy is contrasted by the necessity of your attendance. And your works are often abstracted or diminished, a presence of the self, rather using ephemera, clues, or proxies for bodies. But with this iteration, your bodily presence is paramount. And I wondered if you could speak more about the performative act of self-surveillance, which takes place at Torrington, and maybe how this differs um, in comparison to maybe earlier projects in which you're dealing with control and kind of internalization, yeah, for, forms of containment, maybe. Um, <clears throat> thank you. I mean, yes, I think there are many ways I can dive into that, and mm. I'll, I'll I'll stab at a few. Um, When I when I started to make work that was in some ways self-referential, um, when I started to explore and excavate, um, essentially it all started with Robert Smithson's <laughs> final text called Frederick Law Olmsted and the Dialectical Landscape. And I was always interested in that text and a lot of my work just exploded out of that. And he um, was, uh, talking about the ramble in Central Park that I referenced, which was a very famous cruising, uh, uh, gay male cruising zone in New York City. It was many other things as well. It was a layered space. Um, around that time, I started to be very keenly aware that um, my subjectivity and my um, uh, subjective position within my work um, was going to start to become um, uh, managed and marketed and um and and contained and and used not simply only not, not not simply by myself but by viewers um by 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 publics um so i started to mess with that as much as possible i started to try to think how i could uh, maintain that but also create other layers and to and and to 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 say to talk about myself as more than just a physical body uh, which is what particularly um, in the 1980s and 1990s, one wanted um, a queer body to be, one wanted it to be a, 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 
um, a sexual body in the in 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 an image sense, meaning in a photographic sense. So I always wanted to create sort of spatial relations and formal relations that dodged that, that shifted that, that felt closer to me to how it is to represent a life that is full of conditions, um, one that finds itself tethered between um, institutions, tethered between being looked at and looking at yourself, tethered between um, being contained and being comforted. All of those kinds of conditions seem to me to be a bit more accurate um, representationally, if we're going to use that word, than um, traditional photographic images of a torso or of a body or of a sex sexual act act at the same time uh we were going through the aids crisis when my work was really emerging and and, and gaining a viewership and it was extremely important for me never to negate other practice i never wanted to create an oppositional practice the way one feels you're ought, you you ought to in some ways as a young artist so i was always very conscious that all of these practices mattered in in some sort of in concert with each other and I think one of the things that then triggered and 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 forgive me for this roundabout way of, of approaching it in in 2017 I had the opportunity to do a project in a Marcel Breuer building in New Haven um and it was an initiative of my gallery it was a it was a transactional project it was a commercial project but it was one born of the idea of, of, of having the artists. It's a program that's an ongoing program at Bortolami Gallery in New York. And Stefania had the idea uh, that artists uh, needed to be inspired by other spaces other than the gallery. And also audiences, need. we needed to go out to audiences as well. Um, so it was trying to, to do both things. And I chose a space in New Haven, Connecticut, in a Marcel Breuer building, happened to be, because of that's where I grew up, so this is where this current project in some ways had its roots. And I did by default end up walking people through that space and being very bodily present. The, the project was called Bodybuilding and I did make a conflation between the this Marcel Breuer modernist building that had been truncated and saved and witnessed to many things that I was witness to as a child. I equated us in some ways to make this project happen. And so with this project, I had learned from that and was interested in my physical performance in the space because of that project I had done in, in 2017. Yeah, I was thinking back when you're talking about working against like histories of earlier legacies or providing kind of ul ulterior trajectories, you know, starting with Smith and I was thinking very much about kind of the site and the non-site, how maybe bodybuilding is an example of inverting playing with this logic but I, I was thinking about how Torrington maybe even takes this further by confusing the kind of real world and site of artistic reception um that like the liminal space about the potential inverting the relation or like um operating both as site and non-site simultaneously but this is maybe something interesting coming back to your maybe earlier works and then do you think we should, is there time for maybe um, like another another question or do you think we should open up to the audience now? I'm not quite. Mm -hmm. and we, have, we have a question there, which is fairly similar to what you're just talking about the idea of selfhood and legacy and history. So I suppose the question is there, Alan, not Alan made that question, which is quite similar. So perhaps if you want to ask another question, we have a few more minutes. Um, Adam, if you have any other question on, on your list, we can Yeah, go. maybe just talking, I guess, kind of one of the earlier points about public and audience that you kind of, you're, you're stating that you're kind of looking to re-examine the notions and history of like the romance, maybe the romance and history surrounding the workspace, the, the studio visit and the pilgrimage, having grown bored or frustrated, I guess, with certain conventions and expectations that are kind of tied to classical ideas around the studio. Um, maybe you'd want to speak a little bit more about operating at a geographic remove, maybe has altered the way that the materials or audiences flow through the work comparatively to the more nomadic nature that you had described, like maybe talking about the kind of trilogy of exhibitions that were actually produced most recently out of the space and um, how these new styles of engagement maybe might influence kind of future projects beyond Torrington. 
Yeah, so I I think that the Torrington Project, which is to say me, but the Torrington Project is a huge contradiction. Um, and I'm aware of that. And I, and I hope, I hope that, that um, it's, I, for me, it's very funny because in some ways I've taken 15,000 square feet to almost to be critical of the notion of taking 15,000 square feet. I've taken on something of what might be considered the sort of mega studio uh, space in with the traditional trappings of the um, 19th century romantic uh, Ex repurposing an industrial histories <laughs> um, and sort of like having my cake and eating it too. Um, but I think that's what I wanted it to be inscribed with. I wanted it to be inscribed with this kind of idea that this um, is something I'm stepping into and I will step out of it. Um, I thought an awful lot about other artists and their relationship to studios when I was when I was um, uh, developing these ideas. And as I mentioned, you know, many of the artists that I was schooled under were post-studio or nomadic artists. I worked for many years for Dara Birnbaum, who was a video artist uh, and an architect. And, and the site of its reception was where a lot of the production would happen as well. Um, and, and this, project, this way of thinking very much comes out of a lot of that thinking as well. Um, where, and also just an aside, because one of the things you said, Adam, was I'm, I'm also, why it's a contradiction, I'm, I'm often talking to students and talking to young artists and sort of just wanting it just to be out in the air that one does not need to have a studio. I have had studios in New York City, very expensive studios. I have had years when I've had the corner of a bedroom. And these are not necessarily um, from youth to age. It has been entirely uneven. It's been where I've been emotionally, where I've been economically, where I've been in terms of what I've wanted to accomplish in the world. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, I, I, a cafe has been my studio much of my life or a bar. Um, I think that that's super important to rethink at this time when artists are being very much enmeshed in the economics of gentrification and the and and the and and, and, the, and the conundrum of debt um, and how much debt do, do we want to take on and to whose benefit and who are we serving <laughs> uh, w with regard to that and what does the studio visit start to mean at that point? So that's something that I think I feel very critically about. And I wanted to kind of pronounce here. And so the first period of time here, I um, I kept my galleries sort of at bay in a certain way because I wanted there to be some semblance of autonomy that I was that I was working here, even though it's a fiction, even though it's a fiction. That was part of this theatrical thing that I was doing. I was enjoying that fiction. And how will that take me next? You know, I really don't know. I'm a little bit nervous because now, of course, I'm completely in love with the space, but I have to stick to some level of rigorous thinking and I will have to give it up. And I and I and I and I determined that I will give it up and I'll probably go back into a very, very private zone after this meeting, which is more where, where I used to be. Well, have a very private studio, what I call a studio and that um, in a, an archival space. And I'll take my show on the road more often. Um, and I'll and that kind of dynamic will operate again for me. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Thank you for both those answers. Yeah. <laughs> brilliant. <clears throat> Thank you um, for those brilliant answers. Thank you, Tom, for such a kind of brilliant um, share, for sharing your project because it's a fantastic kind of project. And, you know, it's still a bit to go. I'm looking forward to see the publication, to look at yeah. the forwards where it goes next and just to see where you move from here as well. So um, so thank you both for um, joining us this evening. Thank you for sharing your questions and your and your projects. And for everyone who was online, um, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for the brilliant questions. Thank you for engaging with the with the conversation this evening. Um, and this is going to be available online to, to view uh, once we have done some editing and Tom and I don't agree to have so, so you can watch it some, you know, uh, deep uh, drive into it with a bit more time later on as well. So so that's it from us. Um, see you, our, uh, just remind, I remind you that, you know, Adam's exhibition is open till, uh, till this Sunday. Uh, so we have a few more days. 
again, have a quick peek on the background. Um, so please come and see the show. Uh, we're open Wednesday to Sunday uh, from 12 to 5 and then um, or till 6 on Thursdays. And we're going to be open till 9 o'clock on Friday night for Culture Night. And just keep an eye on our program for Culture Night. Um, we have lots of fun things happening around the gallery uh, on Friday as well. So that's it from us. Thank you very much. And uh, see you around, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Good night.